Hello everybody. Welcome to Angry Harry's MRA Corner, where I am going to be interviewing today Janet Bloomfield, a men's rights activist, also known as Judgy Bitch on her own blog and on Twitter. And the even better news is that, thanks to my technological skills, I didn't manage to record my bit of the conversation. For some reason, only one of the channels was recording. And so, you are only going to hear Janet live, not me. Thank goodness that it wasn't the other channel that had failed. So, I will attempt to edit in my questions at the appropriate points. And let's just hope that my editing skills on this software are a lot better than my technical ones. And so, here she is, the ever-wonderful Janet Bloomfield. At what point in your life did you discover or feel that there was something rather unwholesome about feminism? What were you doing and where were you? Well, I did a, a four-year undergraduate degree in film theory. And even though it's not explicit, um, film theory is actually all done through feminism. So even as I was studying feminism, I could see that there were cracks and flaws in this ideology that just didn't match reality at all. Um, but I, I went along with it and did what I had to do to get the grades that I had to do. I have three brothers at home, so I would be learning all these things about um, men controlling and oppressing me and being in charge of everything in the world. And then I would go back to my life with my three brothers and realize that, that none of those things were actually true. Uh, what, it, what it took for me to make the leap from questioning feminism to thinking about how it affected men, because I didn't do that. Um, I questioned feminism, but it never, it never led me to actually care about men, really, to think about how feminism affected men. That happened when I had a son. I mean, that's when it really, really came home to me. And it's kind of, that's not, that's sort of an embarrassing, it's, it's not something I'm proud of, that I couldn't come, I couldn't start caring about men until it affected me. That's pretty profoundly selfish. But there's a part of me that actually believes there is something deeply, deeply selfish about women. And it's part of the instinct that lets us care for our children. But it's a double-edged sword, right? It also makes it hard for us to care for others. Well, I wouldn't blame you for that, because I think what you've described applies to most people. Did you um, notice the effect that feminism was having upon your brothers. I didn't. I really didn't. And my mother was just a vile feminist. Oh, she used to talk to my brothers about how evil men were and how awful they were and how much they, they were just responsible for every terrible thing in the world. And that, you know, she just wished all men were dead. And she would say this to my three brothers. And perhaps it was the violence of her feminism that I just I just shut it down. I just didn't even want to think about it wasn't able to go there. It was, she was a very traumatic feminist. <laughs> Did your brothers not react to this? One, the one that's right next to me, my youngest, my, the brother closest to me, fought very hard right from the beginning. The youngest and the oldest um, just wanted to appease her. They just wanted love from her. They wanted her approval. So they said nothing, absolutely nothing to her. And interestingly enough, the youngest brother and the oldest brother still have a relationship with my mother, although it's very fraught, where my brother right next to me and myself have nothing to do with her. I No contact whatsoever. I will not expose my children to that level of toxicity. Yeah, I mean, it, it's nice out for me to say say that too. Well, you know, my personal experience with, with the, um, radical feminism was so traumatic that I couldn't apply it to my own life. And that is Perhaps true. Perhaps it is. I feel ashamed that I couldn't do that. Looking back, I feel ashamed that I couldn't, you know, care about my brothers and how that was affecting them. But I don't know what I could have done. You said you were studying uh, film, filming and films 
when you were at college, and that the course was infected with feminism. Can you give me some idea of how it was infected with feminism? Well, the basic idea is something called the gaze, that men control women with a gaze. And it's a very famous um, theorist. Her name is Laura Mulvey. And her idea is she took a couple Alfred Hitchcock films and she would show that in the first shot, it would be a picture of a man's face. And then the camera would flip to show that what he was looking at and it would invariably be a woman. And then the camera would come back to his face And that was men controlling the gays and therefore controlling women. It sounds like a joke to me now, but that actually is the theory of representation. That when you show men looking at women, it means that men oppress and control them with their gaze. I mean, it's such a tiny little step to the ludicrous uh, claims of eye rape, isn't it? It's it's right there in the genesis of, of feminism. And yet I would sit there and, you know, dutifully take my notes in class and study all this. And uh, then I go out to the bar where it's quite the opposite. Women control the gaze. I mean, that's how you communicate to a man, whether you are interested or not interested. It's just a look. You catch someone's eye and you can tell them in you know, half a second exactly whether you're interested them in them or not. Women control and own men. Men have to sort of live up to our gaze. It's the complete opposite of what feminism says. So I I could see that. I could detect that. Like, this is nonsense. Did you um, mention to your tutors and your professors that you had reservations about the course? I wanted A's. I said nothing. (laughs) I dutifully produced. It wasn't until my very last year that I really, really started challenging, especially some of the more radical feminism in my essays. And I suffered for it. But at that point, I was angry and I didn't care. Now, I gather that you're very happy being called a men's rights activist, because that's clearly what you are. But... How do you stumble across men's rights activism and the activists? And what actually motivated you to join them? It started off, I I came at it as a stay-at-home mother. That was my perspective when I was looking around. I got really offended and really upset by people telling me that I was insane to trust a man that, you know, they're they're just all latent monsters, that any man, pick any man off the street, he will start fucking his secretary and leave you and the kids to starve in the street in a heartbeat. And it just angered me so much. Like, where where is the concept of a good man gone? There's good men all around me. I'm surrounded by them. And yet there's this huge story about how men are actually monsters who don't love children, who don't love women, who are only interested in sex with young women, who will destroy their lives for that. And so I started looking around the internet for articles about marriage, and I found the spearhead very quickly. And that led me to A Voice for Men, um, where I actually, it was actually me that triggered the debate about traditionalism, because I'm not a traditionalist. I'm not at home because I think women belong at home. I'm at home because it's almost impossible for me to combine an economically productive job with being a a good mother and a great wife. And those things are more important to me than money. Forced to choose, I choose wife and mother. Ideally, I would like to be able to contribute to my family as well. It's just really tough to do. And what attracted you to those websites, the MRA websites? I found more and more that I agreed with and things that I hadn't even thought about or even considered, like men going their own way. I I had never even heard the words men's rights activists when I first found A Voice for Men. I had no idea what that was. But the language and the the passion, it it never scared me. That never frightened me off in the least. I grew up with three brothers, so I know how guys speak. What a lot of women perceive of as, as you know, being aggressively hyperbolic or using, using um, metaphors that are violent or that kind of stuff didn't shock me. I, I'm okay with guy talk. In fact, I think I'm pretty good at it myself. So there was nothing in it that, that turned me off, just a lot to learn. Were there any particular issues that you were picking up on by visiting those sites? 
attitudes perhaps that alarmed you in any way? Um, you're absolutely insane to get married. Any man who gets who gets married is just an absolute fool. It was sort of the inverse that, you know, women are, or what's the word, hypergamy, that the minute a better man comes along, they're just going to trade you in, that they'll, they'll destroy the family, they'll keep the kids, they'll get all of this, uh, all of your stuff, they'll deny you access to your children, that women are just heartless and cruel and base creatures. That one bothered me. But the more that I read, <clears throat> the more clear it became that, well, in actual fact, a lot of women do do that. I mean, that's that's the really unpleasant reality. And it's it's probably what what sparked the greatest amount of activism for me is to to try and communicate to to women that this the, the culture that feminism is is feeding you on, that divorce is fantastic, that being a single mother is great, that you don't owe men respect, that you're foolish to depend on them. It's it's so destructive. I personally think it's, a, it's destroying our whole entire society to tear men out of families. It's ruining all of us. Indeed. And uh, our population is declining as well. Yeah, and it has been. Women who or in traditional marriages are not only happier than all other women, they have a higher birth rate as well. Now, I know that you spend some of your activism time on uh, Twitter and doing other things on the internet. How do you find it? Do you find it uh, fun, tedious, worthwhile, depressing, or exhilarating, or even threatening? It's enjoyable. It's super fun. I absolutely love it. I don't take Twitter threats seriously. Um, people don't scare me with their stuff. I will laugh at them and mock them. Um, I make rape jokes. I do everything I can to offend, you know, people who are coming to criticize me. I'm just, I'm not a Melody Hensley who got post-traumatic stress disorder. Then again, I also don't get a lot of abuse on Twitter because I'm very quick with my block key. I mean, you... I, I will always tweet that speaking to me is a privilege. It's not a right. And the minute people start getting abusive, I block them. I, I don't let it get to the point of people threatening to rape or kill me. That's I just I take responsibility for what's happening on my Twitter feed and I control it. How do you um, use Twitter? Do you think um, that given the limited amount of space in which you can type text, you have any chance of changing the minds of those who would oppose you? I, I don't think we're convincing anybody. What what we do is get our enemy really riled up so that they make critical errors that we can exploit. But the most important thing about Twitter for me is that it allows you to reach people who are extremely open to our ideas and what we're doing, but who don't know it. Sort of like I was when I started looking around the internet for information. There's like I tailor my tweets to reach out to say um, conservative housewives or libertarians or atheists. There's a lot of different communities who actually have a lot of the same thoughts that we do. They just, it, it's never been articulated for them that, oh, you know, the whole MRM sort of shares your opinion on that. Why don't you check this out and then send a link? So I think it's great for building followers much more so, it's it's great for bringing people into the fold more so than convincing anyone who hates us. But it is still super fun to irritate people who hate us on Twitter. <laughs> Nowadays on Twitter, I find that I have to be a bit more careful in what I say because some of my followers, I don't think would appreciate it if I was uh, too hard in my rhetoric, um, particularly... Uh, some of the followers who um, have professional status. Oh, no, I, I definitely um, ha cut down a lot on the profanity because so many of my followers are, are more Christian and more conservative and they're not interested in that that sort of language and that could very much offend them. I try and stick more to, I call it the calm librarian. I started off as the judgy bitch willing to tell anyone to, you know, shut their cock holster or call anyone a fucking cunt. And now I, t I tend not to do that. I've gone into what I call the calm librarian, which is a little bit more effective. And um, it's not as much, it's not as gratifying and not as much fun, but it's definitely much more effective. 
Is there any particular issue that you talk about that seems to be particularly effective in uh, making people realise that you have something both valid and important to say? I think the big one is reproductive rights. That works on all men. When you talk to men about the fact that they don't actually have any reproductive rights, you can just see the light going off. And for women, it only works if they have a son. Otherwise, they think about it in terms of their right. Well, I want, you know, I should be able to demand support from any man. But if you can frame it in terms of their son, then they can see right away what the problem is. And uh, that that's a very, very effective one for me. Do you talk about your activism um, to your friends and so on? I guess it depends. I, I haven't, because I, I keep my own personal life largely out of this, Janet Bloomfield is not my real name. And most of the people in my life don't actually know what I do. Um, it's, it's not because I'm scared of people calling my house and saying I'm going to kill you. I mean, just bring it, okay? I live in the middle of the woods and I'm a very good shot. So, you know, you go ahead. It's more that I just, I don't want the hassle. It's, I just don't have time for, for fighting that kind of negativity. Eventually, someone will figure out who I am. That's fine. Um, so I don't actually talk face-to-face -face with a lot of women. When I have conversations with women on Twitter or on Facebook or something like that, as long as you can find some way to deeply personalize, to show an individual woman how she will lose, if you can't do that, then there's no hope of, of convincing her of a, you know, that there's a rational argument, which, which is interesting because for other social justice issues, that's not true. I can get someone to care about the, the plight of Palestinian children or the plight of Colombian coffee pickers, and you don't need to be a coffee picker to care. But when it comes to men's rights, women will just shut down unless you can personalize it for them and show how it will hurt them. Whenever women enter a space, they try to make it all about themselves. And I've seen that on A Voice for Men a few times with a few women coming in there and attempting to take all the men's issues and make it about themselves. And that makes that makes me angry. I'm like, do you not see the irony of this? Do you not see that you're doing exactly what we're criticizing? But in the, on the other hand, if you don't, if you don't personalize it and you don't make it about at least a little bit about women you won't get them it's 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 a it's a knife point it's a real sharp razor's edge to walk on so um how are we doing um how would you judge the past 12 months when it comes to the effects of uh, mra activism absolutely interest has increased beyond anything i could have dreamed of from a year ago um, the conference had a really big impact, I think, um, because it generated so much coverage in the media. And then this Women Against Feminism, uh, Facebook and Tumblr, that's drawing women from all over the world. I, I was on HLN, the sister network to CNN today, talking about it. And the reporter mistakenly <clears throat> credits me with the entire thing, which is not true. And I actually told her that in an email, that it was it was not my it was not my idea i didn't create the whole movement um but but it's it's just rolling now like there's so many women who are willing to stand up and as soon as you make it as soon as you make it um palatable where women are not going to suffer if this happens to them i would say it's much easier for a woman to stand up and say yes um i'm a woman against feminism i'm a woman who supports men men's rights than it is for a man. A man who stands up and outs himself as an MRA could be facing some some very serious repercussions. How did the interview on HLN go? It went pretty well, but the woman got very defensive right away. Um, I did get to mention that men don't have reproductive rights, that it, women have all the rights right now. We have all of our rights. Name me one right I wasn't born with. And there's some very important ones that men are not born with, and it's time to address them. And that's what equality means. Did she actually listen to what you were saying? She got defensive, but yes, I think she did. She didn't just shut the point down and say, no, you're wrong, which is typically what they do in, in news reports. 
is just mock and scoff and say, isn't this hilarious? She thinks men don't have reproductive rights. But, you know, this woman was at least willing to acknowledge that that was, in fact, true. Apart from these uh, feminists, are there any other groups of people who, who seem to oppose us? Hmm, uh, the social justice warrior types, I think, which are compl- very closely aligned with feminism, who've sort of drunk the Kool-Aid, in my, in my view, hook, line, and sinker. They actually do believe that they are um, an incredibly powerful, privileged group of people simply because they're white or they're male, and that they need to unpack all of their own privilege and, and make sure that, you know, everyone else has more rights than they do. It's Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, we get accused of that all the time, right? Internalized misogyny and Stockholm Syndrome, which is, it's kind of funny because basically they're saying that I'm a prisoner of my, my husband. Like, really, that's very enlightened. Thank you. Thank you. But I do think social justice warriors actually are, they are siding with the enemy. It's It seems like feminism is too powerful to fight. It's smarter to join. They're collaborators. Every war has gotten them. Every war. Can you tell me about uh, the recent situation with regard to Jason Patrick and this woman whom he had a child with, Jason Patrick being a Hollywood celebrity? Okay, he donated sperm to her and they had a child together. He is identified as the father on the birth certificate. Um, He was not present for the birth of his child didn't go to the doctor's appointments but if you know if that's what qualifies you as your father my my husband is not a father either he went to no appointments <laughs> so he was part of this little boy's life and then she just decided that she didn't want Jason in the child's life anymore and she sued for sole custody and to have Jason denied all, sever all parental relationship legal parental relationships with Gus his son um, and he fought back. He fought back saying, no, 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 you can't do this. I mean, this is my child and I'm entitled to a relationship with him. Well, the judge disagreed because of how Gus was conceived, that because they had used um, IVF instead of traditional intercourse to conceive Gus, that Jason didn't have any parental rights. So he's fighting that in court now. Uh, he's got a group of celebrity supporters, including Brad Pitt, Chris Rock, Whoopi Goldberg, Matt Damon. Um, I'd have to look on the website, but these these are big, big, big names who are coming out in support of father's rights because Jason gave them a morally safe way to do that. Jason's got a fundraiser up on the air. Um, Go there and give some money for him to appeal this decision that he wants to be part of his son's life. He is that he is the boy's biological father. Are there any other places on the internet that uh, are useful for men's rights activists? Well, I found that the Men's Rights Reddit is a fantastic source of new articles, new blogs, new information that you you might not have stumbled across. So I go there every single day. I'm always looking at, at the Men's Rights Reddit. And they are, they are very, very good about posting things that are relevant and interesting. And that has introduced me to lots and lots and lots of different bloggers. Like Captain Capitalism talks mostly about um, the economic impact of our, our culture, especially a feminist culture, on men. So he's just looking at the economic impact, the economics of feminism, which is so interesting. That's really fascinating. And then you can spin it all the way around and go to Doll Rock, who is a Christian father, married father defending marriage. So there's so much interesting stuff out there. And the great clearinghouse for me is Men's Rights Reddit. Given that the number of women who are speaking up against feminism is increasing dramatically, and that there is likely to be, in the not-too-distant future, um, a welling up of sentiment against feminism, might it not be a wise idea to write a book about how you got into the men's rights movement and uh, how um, your mind was changed by understanding the issues further and what it would mean for women? 
uh, in other words, explain to women, A, what fun it is, attacking feminists, and B, how they themselves would benefit from anti-feminism. I think it would be, and Suzanne Venker, who um, has written several books on, on women's choices and how they're making they make the wrong choices, exactly the opposite choices of, of the ones that will make them happy, is working on a book just like that. And I met Suzanne at the International Conference on Men's Issues, and, and we chat on Twitter, and we email each other and message each other. And I'm really looking forward to Suzanne's book. I think it's going to be fantastic. Yes, yes. But would you write a book? I would love to. Um, <clears throat> I would love to. I'm, I'll probably have to wait a few more years until my little one is five and, and she still needs lots and lots of attention. But once she's off to school full time, reliably, I would definitely consider it. I do have 450 blog posts up, so I could probably find material there to uh, to put together a book. It's, it's a daunting project, I suppose. Um, I will think about it, though. <laughs> and that, my dear friends was the end of my conversation with the fabulous Janet Bloomfield. Well, it didn't quite end like that. I mean, I thanked her and uh, we talked for a bit longer, but I can't cope with all the extra editing. So that's the end. To put it bluntly, thank you for listening.